Hello Darklings! I'm back with another director spotlight and this time it is for one of our kings of horror, George Romero. Born in the Bronx in 1940, he spent most of his life and still in fact lives in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And when he was young in the 60s and didn't have any money, he worked with a group of friends and ended up churning out a bunch of television commercials for their own little studio. So it was actually kind of a cool thing that he was working in film constantly with all these crazy kind of avant-garde editing techniques and stuff for TV commercials and stuff like that for a few years before he did his big breakout hit that everybody remembers very clearly still to this day years later which would be Night of the Living Dead filmed in black and white and he and his friends kind of intended this to be a little bit social comedy but mostly like a drive-in flick it wasn't really supposed to be that big of a deal but it was made with a very small budget and it's kind of funny because you have all these really interesting stories surrounding the film's production and its meanings and its distribution. And its distribution was a really big deal in that when they finally got it distributed, their copyright was lost and it was copied and copied and copied in multiple languages with bad dubbing and they could never properly track how much money they made. So still to this day, Romero has, name, has made no money on that film, but if it had been copyrighted per correctly, he probably would have had money in the bank, like big time. It was kind of a crazy, weird, miserable shoot. They used uh, chocolate sauce for blood, like Psycho, and they used all their friends and family, from their dentist to their chiropractor to their butcher to everybody, just like in this little abandoned townhouse, on, like a uh, farmhouse on the edge of Pittsburgh. And it was just a big family effort. And so it's kind of cool. There's also the social tom commentary aspect of it being in the late 60s, and the zombies are us. They are never referred to as zombies in the film. They are just referred to as ghouls. And it's kind of an interesting film. I didn't like it the first time I watched it. I liked it much more upon a rewatch. It was very good. Uh, the other film that he did after this, uh, a few years later in 1972, is The Hungry Wives, also called Season of the Witch. This one I didn't really even know about. I'm only talking about films that he has directed, not produced. And I had never heard of it until I looked it up on IMDb, and it's, you know, exactly what you would think if it's called Season of the Witch, Bored Housewife gets mixed up in witchcraft and murder, because naturally, of course, um, from my understanding, it does not have good reviews. I'll probably get around to watching it eventually, but I have not seen it. This other film, I haven't seen the original, though I have seen the remake, and that is The Crazies. I did like the remake. I thought it was quite interesting and clever, and from my understanding, talking to some people who have seen both, the remake is a little bit better than the original, but I don't know. I can't have an accurate comparison if I've only seen one of the two. And, you know, it's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Crazy people go around murdering. So, yeah, that's always fun. Uh, There's Always Vanilla is from 1972, and I don't know what that is, to be honest. It's another one that he filmed um, with no budget in the early 70s, and I don't know anything about it, so I can't give you an accurate review. The one after that I did see, which is Martin, which is a very intriguing, unconventional vampire film that is often overlooked and very interesting in that it has this whole is he actually a vampire is he just nuts kind of uh quid pro quo it's low budget of course but it has this really good feel to it and it was very good and it was well written and the lead actor definitely portrayed the character of martin quite well and it has a very good uh, idea behind it and that's one of I just love vampire film like indie vampire films that have a unique take on it because it's been done 10,000 10 trillion times and whenever you're able to do it in a fresh new way I always approve so the next one he did after that which is of course very well known which would be Dawn of the Dead I quite like the original even though it's quite long it's like two and a half hours long and it has makeup effects from Tom Savini, one of my favorite makeup artists. He wanted to do the makeup effects in Night of the Living Dead, but wasn't able to because he was in Vietnam being a photographer. So what Vietnam did do for his makeup skills is he saw so much blood and gore, he could make it look realistic on living people. So Dawn of the Dead is kind of interesting that way. It's, a, it's an interesting watch inside of the, at the time, the world's largest indoor mall, which was filmed at night 
during Christmas time. So they had to go in, take all the Christmas decorations down, film, and then put everything back together before the shops open in the morning, which is super frustrating, I'm sure. And it's, again, with that social commentary thing, which is kind of an attack on consumerism. And even though that's not the biggest goal of the film, that is definitely quite interesting. And there's tons and tons of like crazy little stories about this film. I think one of them I really enjoyed was one of the amateur actors um, who was playing a zombie. His character got hit in the head with like a pickaxe and so he was bleeding out the ear. But he also had to go to work in the morning at like 7 a.m. And so he'd been up all night working on this and he's pretty tired. He didn't properly clean off all of his gore and he didn't think about it and he went to work the next day and the customer was looking at him like, um, because he had blood pouring out of his ear. Fake blood, admittedly, but I always liked that story. There's tons of amusing stories about that movie. The next one on here, which I've heard good things about, I do want to see, but have not yet, especially because the idea is so bizarre, is Knight Riders. And this is not a horror film, not really, which is a motorcycle gang that are also knights, as in like the medieval sense of the word. And I'm very curious about this film, and at some point we'll get around to seeing it. The next one on here, which I also very much love, thanks to my addiction to anthology horror films, which would be Creepshow. And you've probably heard of this film. If you haven't, I do highly suggest looking into it because it's scary and funny and it's good little turns. And it's based off of the Tales from the Crypt comics from the 1950s, based off of EC Comics, which I have a major weakness for. And it's pretty fun. I like it quite a lot. My favorite segment is probably The Crate. Uh, but it's, it's fun. I like it quite a bit. The next one he did after that to continue with his, you know, Undead trilogy, which would be Day of the Dead. And this one has a little bit more comedic element, uh, sort of accidentally, than the others. And this is kind of set in a military base. And it's quite interesting. And it's like, instead of the undead population being in the U.S., it's the entire world now. So it's kind of like it gets a little bit larger scale with each progressive film. And this one's also quite interesting, and I was hesitant to watch it, and then it turned out to be worth the watch. I do suggest looking into it instead of just taking my word for it. He was also an executive producer on an anthology TV show, Tales from the Dark Side, which I have mentioned in another video. The next film he directed after that, based off of a Stephen King story, which would be Monkey Shines. And this was kind of an interesting idea, and I'm not going to give away too much because I don't remember it accurately enough to be able to give you a recap, but, but do look into it. It was better than I expected it to be. The film after this, he collaborated on with Dario Argento, and they each did the, he did the second half of the film. It's divided in half, so the first half was Argento's work, and the second half was Romero, and it both were based off of Poe stories, which I am all for, especially because Romero's adaptation of The Black Cat is surprisingly accurate to the original short story, which is great because it's one of my favorite post stories with Harvey Keitel as the main character and it worked pretty well. So that's from 1990. I liked it quite a bit. The next one after that, which I only just watched recently, thanks to my boss lending me the DVD, which was The Dark Half, also based off of a Stephen King story about a writer who tries to kill off his alter ego who manifests himself and tries to kill everybody else. It's pretty interesting. It has like this note of camp, but it has that definite... Stephen King film feel and it's pretty good. I like the makeup effects. They ended up working quite well and it's it's interesting kind of slow burn horror with like big climax that's kind of epically achieved which I approve of. So he didn't direct anything for a few years after that and that was in 92 although because it was released through Orion in 1991 and the film and that company went bankrupt in 1992 it wasn't released until 1993. Anyway the next film that he directed after that and also wrote is Bruiser and a departure from the majority of his films. It's not set in Pittsburgh. It is set in New Jersey. I can't tell you where in New Jersey because I can't remember what city they said. Anyway, part of the reason it was filmed in New Jersey is because of the band who is on my shirt, despite the fact that it's backwards, which is the Misfits. So they provided some music for the film in exchange for him directing two music videos for them, which is pretty cool. And they also live in New Jersey, and they knew places where he could film. This film is very strange and very outside of his usual, which is a guy who paints this ma who creates this blank mask, and then the mask absorbs it to his face, and he loses all identity and starts 
like killing people who had wronged him. It's very trippy and has like this long grandwa underlying metaphor in it, but it's very interesting and it's worth it if only for the one scene where the misfits play live. <laughs> All right, the next films after this that he directed, I have not seen because by this point in the franchise, I couldn't really do it anymore, which would be Land of the Dead, Diary of the Dead, and Survival of the Dead. And I will admit, I haven't seen any of these. I gave up. I only wanted to see the original three. These are not ones that were on my radar. I've heard good things, but I have gotten a little bored of zombies in general, and so I didn't see these. Anyway, I hope this is enough of a list that you can kind of get a sense of Romero's work and go out and watch his films for yourself. Till next time, Darklings. <laughs>